So, let's talk about politics. Yes, that one thing that is guaranteed to get the girl walk out on you the moment you spring it up at the dinner. And no, I'm not giving you an excuse to talk about edgy politics at your next dinner date. I'm just talking politics in general. Believe me, no one wants to hear about it. So if you click off within the first 10 seconds, I totally get it. But you may want to stick around because this is going to be kind of interesting. So let's talk about absolutism. Now, when I say absolutism, quite often people will mix that up with autocracy or totalitarianism. But absolutism is actually a form of government characterized by the rule of a single individual and the centralization of the apparatus of state around said individual. The clearest examples of absolutist rule originate from the early modern period with France and Russia, Sardom and the Kingdom. But it can also be clearly seen in a modern 21st century example of despotic rule in the Russian Federation. The concept of absolutism goes hand in hand with religion and divine right of a particular individual, whether it be by birth or by might to rule over others. This concept gives birth to the notion of that an absolutist ruler is the so-called father of the nation, or pater familias, father of the family, from the Latin, and is therefore responsible for the safety and prosperity of that entire nation. Therefore, their rule is hedged on the success of that nation. This concept of divine right to rule and the centralization of power around such an individual can have disastrous consequences, therefore, for the nation and the absolutist ruler in question if something goes wrong. Like you invade your neighbour and cock it up. The rise of absolutism in France, for example, and this is where the term really comes from, is not a sudden event but a gradual progression of power centralising behind the sovereign and removed from the aristocracy. Early France essentially is Paris, ruled by the king, and some nominally subjected dukes around it. Technically, the Duke of Normandy was subject to the King of France. However, the Duke of Normandy, after 1066, was the King of England. The King of England did not listen to the King of France. See where I'm coming from here. So, Durand actually described this movement towards absolutism as an endless struggle by the sovereign to free themselves from the shackles of law. And no matter how hard the ruler tries, they will never really fully achieve direct independence to rule. And this slow humbling of the French aristocrats, you could replace that word aristocrat with oligarch, but we'll get to that in a minute, in many ways was borne by the historical power held by that French nobility. As, as I mentioned before, the Kingdom of France effectively was Paris and very powerful dukes around it. That's why you see so many duchies rebel and almost overthrow and even overthrow the king at certain points. Further to this, let's talk about Louis XIV in 1648. This is where it really begins. He has a regency council originally appointed to rule because he's nine when he becomes king. And that regency council appointed seven edicts, of which six were increasing the power of taxation. In short, order to the provincial appellate court, the parliaments rebelled, and a series of civil wars known as the Fronde started, and they would continue until 1653. The absolute defeat of the nobles during the Fronde, along with an early rebellion and edicts such as the Royal Decree of 1626 demanding the demolition of feudal castles, again, removing power from these, du these dukes and other nobles, it greatly reduced the power of the nobility and increased the power of Louis XIII and then XIV and Anne Cardinal Richelieu, and it cripples the French nobility and makes them sort of reliant on Louis XIV, especially after he builds Versailles and essentially makes a zoo of nobles all vying to be the best one ever to get his favour and to do whatever he wants to basically, he, they, he says jump, they say how high. Remind you of any certain Soloviki, Kadyrov, used to be Prigozhin, you start to see some similarities here. So the humbling of power of people who notionally would rule a state, and in the West, we would call these, for example, politicians. Can, you can imagine, for example, and this could never happen because his head would come off, if King Charles III turned around tomorrow and dissolved Parliament, and it flat out said, hey, Parliament's over, all go home, I'm taking royal rule again. He would be humbling the authority, massively, yes, but this would not be absolutist rule, this would be dictatorial rule, and a key part of absolutist rule here 
is getting that divine right. And it is getting effectively the go ahead from the apparatus of state and church to make you seem like you are the only option to intertie your fate with that of the nation state. You are the father and the controller of the nation. So if, if Charles was to, for example, do that and to dissolve parliament and then to have the Church of England, of which, say, for example, England was completely Anglican at this point, um, appoint him as, you know, sovereign for life, we all listen to him now, you would start to see this justification of divine rights rule mixed in with absolute power. Therefore, you would start to see an absolutist rule. The notion that a monarch is divinely chosen by God as his representative on earth to rule was not an invention of Louis XIV, but this is where it starts to really become to the forefront of knowledge. And it existed for hundreds of years, and it was within Louis XIV, however, that we noticed the necessity of divine right to maintain absolutist rule, and it becomes a core tenet of it. Louis XIV is famously stylized as Le Roi Soleil. I can't speak French, I speak German. It means the Sun King. And the name quite literally being an anachronism for the Sun, which Louis XIV was at the center of the world and the universe, with the world being France, because they're French, revolving around him. This verbose stylization was not a mistake, nor is it an overstatement. Louis XIV ruled as if he had been selected by God to steward France, because at his core, it is believed that Louis believed this. He bought into his own Kool-Aid, essentially. Further to the notion of one king, one law, one faith, and yes, that is a genuine slogan from the period, is the action taken by Louis XIV and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, or Nantes. Again, I don't speak French, these words are hard. And by repealing this edict, any protections that non-Catholics had within France, particularly the Huguenots, vanished effectively overnight, and the Catholic Church firmly was established as the dominant religion, with Louis XIV, the King of France, as the direct link of his subjects to the Pope, therefore he's chosen by God to rule in their stead. Rule by divine right and the taming of the aristocracy into obedient servants firmly centralized power of the French state around this, a single entity, namely Louis XIV. This centralization of power in, into absolute rule by the individual is a model in which other rulers have attempted to emulate, both contemporarily, in the case of Louis XIV, Peter the Great did this in Russia, and to an extent so did Frederick in Prussia. And they've attempted to do this, as, in, as I said, contemporarily, but also in the modern era. And this is where I want to talk about Putin and Putinism, which is commonly called Fascism. It's not fascism. Fascism in itself is not a single thing. The Nazis in themselves, for example, you can't simply say they are fascist. It is factually correct to call them fascist, yes. However, it is lazy. And we don't do lazy when it comes to history. If you do lazy when it comes to history, go somewhere else. This is not lazy. Rulers have sought to emulate the power and prestige of Louis XIV since before his death, like I mentioned. Now, a key example of this emulation is Peter the Great of Russia, and he goes so far to, to follow Louis in establishing a new capital away from Moscow, he, this is St. Petersburg, and he centralizes power around himself as Russia's God-given ruler, and, the, and he does this by moving that capital from Moscow to St. Petersburg, yes, in a way that Louis XIV did this, essentially by moving the capital from Paris to Versailles. There is a distinction in the modern sense, Versailles is merely a suburb outside of Paris or outside the Parisian city center. During this period, Paris is much, much smaller. So Versailles is actually a little bit of a distance away and there's bandits everywhere because it's the 1640s in France. What, what else do you expect? In this sense, the modern era saw the Russian empire collapse in, in some ways. The Soviet Union can in many ways be argued as a continuation of the Russian Empire, especially with its centralization of power around an individual. Originally not being the idea, of course, but it, it grew to become that during the Russian Civil War. And there's many reasons you could argue that Stalin is an absolutist ruler. And for example, Stalin himself, he uses not religion to centralize the state around him, but in a way he effectively turns communist ideals and, and Stalinist communism into almost a religious entity to surround himself with. So there is an argument to be made with that. I could come back and examine Stalin at a later date. Probably will. I find him quite interesting. The Soviet Union is characterized, like the Russian Empire, by being led by a strong man, not through God, but through power. And when the Soviet Union collapses and Russia comes out 
of the other side of it, you start to see very quickly that a weak ruler such as Yeltsin cannot survive. Putin, a strong man in his own words, believes he emulates Tsar Peter. And he, his goal is ultimately to emulate Peter with the ultimate goal of forming an absolutist rule. This is why Putinism is absolutism at its very core, and it's closer to Louis XIV than it is to, for example, Adolf Hitler. When Russia first became an independent state, it became ruled by effectively an oligarchy. We have all heard about the famous olig oligarchs. The oligarchs effectively were aristocrats. There is no other way to put it. They were the aristoc they are the aristocrats of Russia. So Russia in the 1990s can best be described as a neo-aristocracy. And, and there's really no other way to put it. And it has been recorded upon assent that the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, forced all oligarchs within the Russian Federation to attend a summit at the former Dacha of Joseph Stalin, wherein he made clear that he was the sole ruler of Russia and not them. When Mikhail Khodorkovsky, again, like I said in the last video, I'm I'm pale and Anglo. Give give me some give me some time with this. I can write it. Just that's a hard name to say. But anyway, he refused to take this lesson to heart, and he was in prison for 10 years on tax charges, and then being, was effectively forced to live in exile. This is not dissimilar to what Louis XIII did in 1626 with the feudal fortresses. It was an act of force designed to centralise the ruling aristocracy of state around a single person, which it has, and to build that reliance on that single person as the father of the nation. Putin himself is quite often called uncle by the Russian people, and it's something he encourages. It is that power centralized around himself. It is absolutist rule. And although rule by divine right you'd think has fallen out of favor in the 21st century, in the Islamic world it sure as hell hasn't, but in, in Christian countries you, you'd argue that it has, Putin does rely on absolutist rule and to rule by divine right to maintain his power. For example, the Russian Orthodox Church is completely subservient to the Kremlin, and it can be drawn in parallel to the Catholic Church subservience to France in, during the rule of Louis XIV. An example of this power and this reliance of the Church on Putin and this use of the Church by Putin to further his goals of state can be seen in the statements of Patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox Church. He is an appointee of Putin himself and has remained a close ally during the Russo-Ukrainian War. Uh, referring more so to the invasion post-2022 here. The patriarch once described Putin as a miracle of God. That is a direct quote, a miracle of God. <laughs> Clearly, he's been drinking crocodile. And Lord, Lord of the Leaders orders to invade Ukraine to destroy another quote, the forces of evil. As a footnote, it should be clarified that both Ukraine and Russia are predominantly Orthodox Christian nations. And the Russian Orthodox Church draws its origins from St. Andrew's Church in the city of Kiev in Ukraine, Kiev being the mother of all Rus cities. See my last video for an example on why they're different cultures, but inescapably linked. These inflammatory statements are designed to provide justification to the actions of the absolutist ruler in the form of divine right. And he's doing what is necessary to undertake the stewardship of his nation as the father figure. That is essentially what Putin is doing. He is an absolutist ruler, ruling with divine right, and with the very notion that he is the Russian state. Absolutism came to bite the French in the butt. Quite literally, well, not the butt, more so the neck. It became a bit of a pain in the neck for Louis XVI, if you know what I mean. Um, the civil unrest caused by the 2022 escalation of the war of Ukraine has damaged that aura of invincibility around Putin. 2020, Putin was able to poison and imprison the opposition leader Alexei Navalny with no backlash, effectively. Similarly, he was able to, over the last decade, remove all political parties which were a threat to his grip on power. Funnily enough, the Nazi parties in Russia moved to the Donbass and helped with the overthrow of Ukraine's government and forces in the region. The tankies don't like to talk about that, but that's what happened. I might talk about that at another date. This invasion, though, has inescapably damaged Putin's grip on power. This is the downside of the whole father of the nation concept. His fate is tied to the Russian nation. So upon the announcement of what he has called a partial mobilization, major protest 
broke out in cities across Russia with over 500 citizens being arrested in Moscow alone for anti-war protests, and an unknown number has fled abroad. The current example of civil unrest in Russia, what with the Wagner Rebellion, is not an attempt to summarize that Vladimir Putin will meet the same fate as the Ancien Regime in France with the beheadings and, and a crowd and such. Moreover, it is a clear example of the betrayal and reaction of the citizenry to a ruler who utilizes absolutism to retain power. Akin to the French king, Putin's centralization of power and his use of the Russian Orthodox Church and other apparatus of state as an avenue to gain legitimacy has cemented his place in Russia as the absolute ruler and father of the nation. And with this ultimate responsibility in times of crisis, ultimately he is responsible for what happens next to the Russian state and to the Russian people. Ergo, when a lot of Russian children start dying, when I say children, I mean 16 to 18 year olds, because if you look at the victory parade, they're all bloody kids. It is on him. The mothers of these children will look at him and go, why is my son dead, father of the nation? Uncle Vlad, what are you doing? Absolutism as a form of government is characterized by the rule of a single individual and the centralization of the apparatus of state around said individual. The clearest examples of absolutist rule originate from the early modern period with the empires of France and Russia, but it can also be clearly seen in the 21st century in the Russian Federation under Vladimir Putin. Absolutist rulers rely on that concept of divine right as a way to cement their legitimacy, with Louis XIV, for example, using the Catholic Church and Vladimir Putin using the Russian Orthodox Church to reinforce this concept. It's not uncommon for Ukraine to be referred to as evil or the West, the evil West, the forces of Satan. Honestly, watch Russian propaganda channels. They're absolutely hilarious to watch. They are so entertaining. There's that woman on there. She's got brunette hair. She's now my favorite TV villain. She's honestly just a cartoon villain. It's absolutely brilliant. Absolutism can and does have disastrous consequences though for both the nation itself under absolutist rule and the absolutist rule as person. This is exhibited pretty heavily by the downfall of the French monarchy during the revolution and the absolute bushwhacking France got in the following years when things started not to go so well for Napoleon. The current civil unrest in Russia is likely to grow, and it probably will. And you can come back to this video and you can call me wrong if it doesn't, but I'm telling you I firmly believe, based on historical analysis, that it will continue to grow and it will get worse. Only time can truly tell.